Antisocial Personality Disorder, or ASPD, is a condition that's characterized by a persistent pattern of behavior that infringes on the rights and safety of others, including purposeful deception, theft, fraud, aggression, and even violence. The idea of a psychiatric diagnosis based around a pattern of bad behavior seems simple enough. However, when you scratch below the surface, ASPD is a surprisingly complicated disorder to understand. This is because ASPD is really two different disorders masquerading as one. To understand this better, let's look at the DSM criteria for ASPD themselves. These criteria are captured in the mnemonic Acid Liar, with three or more of the last seven items being required. First, A is for adult. By definition, ASPD cannot be diagnosed before the age of 18. However, the pattern of antisocial behavior must have started by the age of 15, if not even earlier. In this way, ASPD is a diagnosis that begins in childhood, even if it cannot be diagnosed until the patient is an adult. Next, C is for criminality. People with ASPD often engage in actions that fall outside of the law, including stealing, fraud, and drug trafficking. This leads many to be arrested or spend time in jail due to their actions. Next, I is for impulsivity. People with ASPD tend to be highly impulsive and will often act on a whim without considering the consequences of their actions. This is accompanied by general failure to engage in purposeful or planned behavior, which makes things like having a job or finishing school very difficult. If you've watched the video on personality disorders, then it will not come as a surprise that ASPD is correlated with low conscientiousness in the big five personality traits. Next, D is for disregard for safety. People with ASPD routinely ignore, disregard, or show outright disdain for the safety of not only themselves but others as well, such as recklessly speeding through a residential street where children are playing. Next, L is for lying. People with ASPD frequently lie, cheat, and deceive others. This is often done for some kind of secondary gain, such as stealing someone's credit card information, although some people with ASPD will mislead others simply for the thrill of it. Next, I is for irresponsibility. Another manifestation of the low conscientiousness seen in ASPD is a chronic failure to honor both personal and societal obligations, such as refusing to repay debts, neglecting to care for children, and being unwilling to work. Next, A is for aggression. Physical aggression and even violence can be a manifestation of ASPD. Notably, this is not the kind of purposeless agitation that's seen in other conditions like delirium or substance intoxication. Instead, people with ASPD tend to attack others in a purposeful or targeted way, such as hitting another person in the face if they feel that they've been insulted by them. Finally, R is for remorselessness. Some people with ASPD will show a lack of remorse for their actions, such as trying to rationalize aggressive behavior by saying that the other person deserved it or that they had no choice but to act that way. However, this is not necessarily diagnostic and some patients do show remorse, especially when they've acted impulsively. So those are the diagnostic criteria for ASPD. If you look at them closely, you'll realize that they are all basically just descriptions of different forms of bad behavior. By keeping the diagnosis rooted in objectively observed behaviors, the DSM has made it so that ASPD is a reliable disorder, meaning that two different clinicians will generally agree that the diagnosis does or does not fit a particular patient. However, the downside of this approach is that it does not account for the less objective, though ultimately probably more relevant question of why someone is engaging in this bad behavior. After all, people commit antisocial behavior for any number of reasons. For example, think of a man who frequently steals. Does he steal because he lives in poverty and has a hungry family? Or does he come from a privileged background and instead steal for the thrill of it? Does he suffer from an addiction and need money to fuel his habit? Or did he never develop an inner sense of morality and can't tell right from wrong? Because the reasons for bad behavior are so numerous, it seems misguided to attempt to lump all of them together under a single diagnosis. Yet that's exactly what the DSM attempts to do, and the results are telling. ASPD as a diagnosis has very poor validity and little prognostic value. It's only when you break down the causes of bad behavior that clear patterns begin to emerge. When antisocial behavior is caused by one's circumstances, like the man living in poverty who steals to feed his family, you would expect the behavior to improve when the situation changes. These people would generally not be diagnosed with ASPD. However, when you focus specifically on people who consistently and repeatedly engage in antisocial behavior regardless of their circumstances, two general patterns are seen. The first pattern is characterized by a mixture of emotional instability, 
a sensitivity to rejection, and a tendency towards impulsivity that makes people likely to lash out with aggression or violence when they feel threatened. We will refer to this first pattern as Cluster B ASPD. The second pattern is instead characterized by a distinct absence of emotional reactivity that, combined with a lack of empathy, a decreased fear response, and chronic feelings of boredom, makes people more likely to engage in violent behavior. We'll call this second pattern psychopathy. At their core, these are very different reasons for engaging in antisocial behavior, and accordingly, these two patient populations require very different approaches in clinical settings. To help keep them straight in our mind, we will split this topic into two different lectures. Cluster B ASPD is more common, accounting for 90% of all cases, so we'll focus on that for this video and save a discussion of psychopathy for the next video. To understand Cluster B ASPD better, let's revisit the diagnostic criteria from earlier. As a starting point, it's important to realize that most people with ASPD do not go around trying to be bad people. Instead, people with ASPD engage in antagonistic behavior as a way of externalizing negative emotions by taking them out on others. This contrasts with internalizing, which is the process of directing negative emotions inward towards the self, which instead results in disorders like depression and anxiety. As you might expect from a cluster B personality disorder, people with ASPD often have a sense of emotional instability with a tendency towards both effective lability and strong reactions to interpersonal triggers such as being rejected, devalued, or humiliated. Just as someone with borderline personality disorder might resort to self-harm or suicidal threats in response to a stressor, someone with ASPD has found that threats, aggression, and violence are an effective way of handling their emotions, even if they often have negative consequences later. This pattern is known as reactive violence. Patients will generally report that their impulsive outbursts are immediately preceded by intense and overwhelming feelings of anger, sadness, and irritability for which the patient needs to do something in order to discharge the emotion and regain a sense of control. For example, a patient with ASPD may grab a knife and threaten his disabled mother in response to a comment she made that made him feel humiliated. Aggressive acts like this are often immediately followed by an emotional thrill or feeling of power that helps to distract from the wounded feeling at the core of the situation. The emotional explosions that precede aggressive acts are often superimposed on top of a long-lasting tendency towards negative emotions, including feelings of emptiness, boredom, meaninglessness, and alienation. This further links ASPD to cluster B, as high neuroticism is a common finding across all cluster B personality disorders. While reactive violence is the primary pattern seen in ASPD, many people with this disorder also commit premeditated acts such as stealing or defrauding others. These acts are normally justified on the basis of saying that I need to look after myself because no one else will, a rationalization that makes more sense when you consider the history of both familial and societal neglect that is often found in the backgrounds of people with ASPD, with many having grown up in impoverished environments and lacking one or both biological parents in their lives. While the behavioral excesses of ASPD, like theft or violence, are often the most noticeable, Patients with this disorder often have specific deficits as well, including profoundly poor social skills, lack of executive function, and difficulty understanding rule-based structures. This often leads them to have few acquaintances and no close friends, resulting in a persistent sense of loneliness and isolation that further drives the negative emotions underlying the aggressive behavior. Putting this entire picture together, ASPD is revealed to have the same core cluster B-ness as borderline, narcissistic, and even, to a certain extent, histrionic personality disorder. While aggression is undoubtedly a more destructive way of coping with negative emotions, the overall pattern is the same. So now that we have an understanding of not only the diagnostic criteria for ASPD, but also the reasons why patients engage in this behavior, let's look at the data behind this disorder, including who's diagnosed with it, what happens once they're diagnosed, and what forms of treatment are effective. ASPD is common, with up to 5% of people having the disorder. It is even more common in certain settings such as prisons or jails, with up to half of all criminal inmates meeting criteria for the diagnosis. While ASPD cannot be diagnosed before the age of 18, the initial pattern of bad behavior almost always began during childhood and adolescence. In fact, antisocial behaviors are even more common in children and adolescents than adults, with up to 10% of youth showing a consistent pattern of disruptive behavior. The prevalence is significantly higher in certain areas such as the child welfare system, 
where up to 25% of children living in orphanages or foster care show signs of an externalizing disorder. Children and adolescents showing these patterns are instead diagnosed with one or more externalizing disorders, known formally as disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders in the DSM, including oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, intermittent explosive disorder, and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. The details of these disorders are beyond the scope of this lecture, but for now just keep in mind that these are separate diagnoses for antisocial behavior in people under the age of 18. While environment plays a significant role in the development of ASPD, genetics are a major factor as well. In fact, around half of the variation seen in antisocial behavior from one person to the next appears to be related to heritable factors. In addition, a significant gender gap exists in ASPD, as it is up to five times more common in men than in women. As noted in the video on cluster B personality disorders, it is likely that cultural factors play a large role here, as aggression may be seen as a more acceptable way of handling negative emotions for men as compared to women. However, biological factors likely play a major role as well. Similar to other cluster B personality disorders, ASPD has a tendency to peak in adolescence and early adulthood, with a natural lessening of severity by one's 30s and 40s. In fact, around a quarter of patients show major improvement and another quarter improve to the point that they no longer meet criteria for the disorder. Even among people who improve, however, ASPD can still be thought of as a lifelong disorder, as most patients continue to struggle with some features of the disorder even into older age, including negative mood states, poor occupational functioning, ongoing substance use, and difficult relationships. ASPD is considered to be a difficult disorder to treat, as no medications or psychotherapies have been shown to be consistently or robustly effective at reducing rates of reoffending, increasing life satisfaction, or improving the level of social or occupational functioning. The one possible exception to this is the symptom of impulsivity. For patients for whom impulsivity plays a major role in antisocial behavior, there is weak evidence that various forms of psychotherapy, particularly ones that were developed to treat borderline personality disorder, such as dialectical behavior therapy, can have some positive effects. In addition, medications like anticonvulsants may also have small effects in reducing impulsivity. However, intervention of any kind tends to be limited by the fact that people with ASPD often show very little motivation for treatment. In real-world settings, jail and prison systems are often used as a legal rather than clinical intervention if patients engage in illegal behavior. Data suggests that, while short periods of incarceration lasting less than a year may be associated with lower rates of reoffending in the future, keeping people jailed for longer periods does not reduce the risk of recidivism. Importantly, incarceration is not a clinical treatment, and while it may be necessary at times to protect society from harm, medical providers should not view it as an acceptable form of treatment for ASPD. As one psychiatrist put it, the only effective treatment for antisocial personality disorder appears to be the passage of time. So that is the cluster B version of ASPD. In the next video, we'll talk about psychopathy as the other form that ASPD can take, so consider subscribing to this channel to be notified of when that video is available. If you can't wait until then, or are simply interested in learning about this material in a higher level, consider checking out my book, Memorable Psychiatry on Amazon. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.